But let's turn in our Bibles to two passages of Scripture. I want you to turn to John chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 11. John 5 and 1 Corinthians 11. The title of my message is, Do You Want to Change Your Life? You know, we all have questions we would like to ask God one day, right? Has anything ever happened to you that seemed to make no sense at all? And you thought, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna ask God why he let this happen. Well, I want you to know that God has some questions that he wants to ask you as well. And we're gonna look at that in a few moments, but USA Today recently did a poll and they asked the question, what would adults ask a God or a supreme being if they could get a direct answer? 19% wanted to know, will I have life after death? 6% wanted to know, how long will I live? And 34% wanted to know, what's my purpose here? Those are good questions. To answer them quickly, will I have life after death? The answer is absolutely. You have two options, smoking and non-smoking. <laughs> Heaven or hell, that's entirely up to you. Will you spend eternity? On number two, how long will I live? Don't know the answer to that one. I'm not so sure I'd wanna know the answer to that one, but only God knows that. Lastly, what is my purpose here? Your purpose here on earth is to know God and to bring Him glory. But now let's think about the questions that God has for us. And before us is a story of a man in a seemingly hopeless situation. He was abandoned, uncared for, unable to help himself, and desperately lonely. And so Jesus comes to this man and asks him a poignant question. A question I think in effect God is still asking of us today. Let's read it now. John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 to 18. And by the way, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said. I have no one to put me in the pool, and when the bob water bubbles up, someone always gets there ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately the man was healed and he rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. So this miracle happened on the Sabbath and the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. He replied, well the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. We're gonna come back to that verse, underline it. Verse 16, then the man, excuse me, 15, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders it was Jesus who had healed him, but the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. And the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him, for he not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his Father, hereby making himself equal with God. We'll stop right there. I want you to notice that verse five begins with the word after word. And why is that important? Because it shows there's a momentum in the life of the Lord. There was a before, during, and after for Christ. He was on a schedule. He was working on a timetable. He had people to heal. He had words to share. He had lives to impact. People that needed his healing touch. So he was moving according to a schedule. He had appointments so long ago in the councils of eternity that he needed to keep. And by the way, Jesus always keeps his appointments. He already met with Nicodemus at night. He met with that woman at the well that didn't even know she had an appointment. Now he is making his way ultimately toward the cross. So we see a momentum. And in the same way in your life, God is leading you as a Christian. As Christians, we do not believe in coincidence. We believe in providence. That's very important. Because sometimes we'll say, well, that's a coincidence, is it? 
Or is it providence? For us to say, well, I was really lucky today. I don't really believe in luck. I believe in the Lord's leading. So the Lord was moving on a schedule here chronologically. Uh, he's already been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. He's healed many, including a demon-possessed man, Peter's mother-in-law, a leper, and a paralytic. But the man that Jesus was healing here in John 5, this healing was going to cost him. In fact, this moment marks a turning point in the life and ministry of Christ. Up to this time, the religious leaders tolerated him, but now they turn openly against him. The statements that Christ makes here ultimately cost him his life because the religious leaders went into a blind rage from this day forward and their sole purpose became the silencing of this mysterious man from Galilee. Why were they so ticked off? It was because of the claim that he made. He said in verse 17, my father and I. He was claiming to be equal with God and they got that memo and they decided they wanted to kill him for it. But this is also the story of a lonely man. And you know Jesus often sought out lonely people in scripture. It's almost as though he was drawn to lonely people. Like the woman at the well. Like Zacchaeus who was up in that tree as Christ made his way into the city of Jericho. Uh, like this woman here that we're reading about, uh, or, or excuse me, like this man here that we're reading about in this story. And there's so many lonely people out there right now. And you know, you might be very successful and be lonely, and you might be very unsuccessful and be lonely, but everyone experiences it. In fact, you could even say that every person on the face of the earth is built with sort of a loneliness deep inside. Did you hear about this fashion designer, Lorenz Scott? who committed suicide recently. Her designs are worn by Madonna, Sarah Jessica Parker, Angelina Jolie, Nicole Kidman, Penelope Cruz, <laughs> excuse me, and by the First Lady, Michelle Obama. And she was a girlfriend of famed Rolling Stones frontman, Mick Jagger. A one article about her said, with homes around the world and an A-list clientele and the support of her boyfriend for more than a decade, Loren Scott appeared to lead a fairy tale life, but she tragically hung herself in Jagger's 5.6 million apartment uh, in Manhattan. An article stated, quote, prior to this she spent a week alone at Jagger's luxurious beachfront villa on the private island of Mustique earlier this month when he toured and partied with the Rolling Stones in the Far East. The tragic brunette normally posted pics from the Caribbean island on her Instagram account but was strangely silent online during her solo getaway. Instead, one of the model turned designers final post to her account which was deleted after her death reportedly read, quote, fashion is the armor to survive the reality of life, end quote. Yeah, no, fashion is not the armor to survive the reality of life. You can see that this woman, despite her incredible success, was lonely deep down inside. And here's this man in our story, sitting by a pool of water. See, there was a local legend that said, periodically, an angel would appear, stir the waters up, and whoever was first in the water would be healed of whatever his or her infirmity was. Now there's no support to this. It's a legend, as I said. But uh, this man and many others believed it. You can't blame a person for hoping. He had been paralyzed for 38 years. Uh, he was unable to get out of the situation he was in. We don't know how this paralysis took place. If it was an accident, if he was born this way, we don't know. But what we do know is there were a lot of sick and hurting people, but it's worth noting that Jesus singled this man out in particular. And then Christ makes a provocative statement. Look at verse 14. After he heals him and he says, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Listen, this would seem to indicate that this man's particular condition was linked to his personal sin. That is not to say that if you have a disability or if you are sick, it's because of your sin and God's punishing you. Because the fact of the matter is all disability, all sickness, aging, and even the death 
experience is a part of the curse. Because one man sinned, Adam, sin entered the human race, and thus we all age, we all uh, begin to lose our abilities and time, and of course we all have to die. If Adam had not eaten of the forbidden fruit, uh, man would have never died, but now we do. So in a broad sense, all illness is a result of sin, but Jesus is saying, and we don't want to miss this, that in this man's case, there was a direct link between his sin and the condition he was in. That's fascinating to me. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But I want you to notice that all he had to do was ask for God's help. Do you know the only thing that is stopping you from receiving God's healing in some cases is a mere request? Do you know the only thing that is stopping the Lord from providing for your financial needs is a request on your part? Do you know the only reason you have not received that divine direction is because you've not prayed about it? Because the Bible says you have not because you ask not. Now sometimes you can ask and God will say no. That's an answer by the way. <laughs> not the answer we like, but it's an answer. But sometimes the Lord wants to say yes and it's coming down to this simple truth. You have not because you ask not. Well I already prayed about it and God didn't say yes. We'll pray about it again. Well I prayed about it twice and God didn't say yes. We'll pray about it a third time. <laughs> Jesus said keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking and the door will be open. Now the Lord might say after a time don't ask me anymore. My grace is sufficient for you, as he said to Paul, who requested that thorn in the flesh be removed. But then again, the Lord might just say, okay, I'm gonna do that for you. And that's what he did for this man. I think it was the utter helplessness of this man that drew Jesus to him. Perhaps that man had cried out in the cold night for God to help him. Maybe he even groaned a quiet prayer that morning. Lord, send an angel to stir the waters. Help me get to the water's edge. <laughs> Little did he know the Lord wasn't going to send an angel. The Lord was going to come himself. God incarnate was going to appear to him and not stir the waters, but God was going to stir his soul, stir his life, and not only touch him physically, but spiritually as well, because God is able to do abundantly above and beyond that which we could ask or think. Sometimes we limit the Lord in our prayers. You know, I'd say, I have an unpaid bill. I need $100. I'm gonna pray, Lord, send me $100. But, you know, not your will, but, not my will, but thine be done. We'd say, well, I'm afraid to pray that because it might cancel my prayer out. What kind of a warped concept do you have of God? How do you know God doesn't want to give you more? Say, Lord, I need $100 to pay this bill. However, if you want to give me more, hallelujah. <laughs> Maybe the Lord will give you more. Don't limit the Lord. This guy just wanted someone to help him to get to the water's edge and said God himself came to him and transformed his life. And what a sad group of people are sitting around these pools of Bethesda. Look at verse three. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. The word paralyzed can be translated without strength. Another translation is hopeless and powerless. That's a picture of all of us before we're Christians were paralyzed by our sin. Romans 5 says, while we were without strength, Christ died for us. You know, sometimes people will say, the Bible tells us God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? Hate to break this to you. That's not in the Bible. Along with cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, it may be a good thing to tell your kids because you want them to wash up, but it's not in Scripture. And to the point that idea, God helps those who help themselves, is not only in the Bible, but it's not even biblical in its approach. If you were to sum up what the Bible teaches, it would go along these lines. God helps those who can't help themselves, or even better, God helps the helpless. That's who this man was. He was helpless and he was hopeless. Others were blind, it says. And before we're Christians, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world blinds our eyes. That's speaking of Satan. Proverbs 4.19 says, the way of the wicked is as darkness, and they don't know where they're going, so they stumble. You know, you can be lost. There are times when I travel, and I'm in a hotel room, and, and I'll wake up in the middle of the night, and I don't know where I am. I don't even know where the lamp is. You know, because I'm in a strange place. 
That's us before we're Christians. We're stumbling around in the dark. But look at verse 6. Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says there's a great multitude. It doesn't say Jesus saw them, though he did technically, but he saw him. There was something about this man that drew Jesus to him, you see? And Jesus also knew, verse 6, that he had been ill for a long time. Jesus knew this man better than anyone else. Jesus knew this man better than this man knew himself. And the same is true of us. Now the Lord asks this probing question, would you like to get well? <laughs> what kind of question is that to ask someone who's been paralyzed for 38 years? A very good question actually. Because not everybody wants to get better. Not everybody wants to have their life changed by God. There are some people that like the state they're in. Did you know that? You might think of oh, that poor person who's a drug addict. They want to be free. Not necessarily. That person who's an alcoholic, they don't want to do that anymore. Not necessarily. That person who's addicted to porn, they don't want that anymore. Not necessarily. There's nothing you can do for a person if they don't want to change. All of the interventions, all of the sermons, all of your attempts to convince them are not going to work if they themselves don't want to change. So it's a valid question. Do you want to be made well, or the way I've phrased it for the title of the message, do you want to change your life? Or do you want your life to change? Do you really want it? Because if you don't want it, nothing is really going to happen. Some people are comfortable in the state they're in, not unlike a pig in a pigsty. <laughs> do you know why pigs like pigsties, by the way? Because pigs don't sweat. Uh, so they get hot. Did you know pigs don't sweat? Have you ever seen a pig sweat? <laughs> They're pretty relaxed. Life's good for a pig. Eat anything they want. Lay around. Never have to shower. Hang out with other people that smell and look like you. You know, it's the life of a pig. But because they can't sweat, the way they cool themselves down is getting into the pig sty, the pig pen. So a pig is really comfortable there. That is their sweet spot. You know, I know people like to have pigs as pets and they clean them up, you know, and they wash them and they put little outfits on them. Pig's not happy. <laughs> pig is not digging that at all. I had a friend who had a pig. He took it to the beach. I'm not making this up. <clears throat> he says, oh yeah, we take the pig to the beach. I said, you've got to be joking. He goes, yeah, you have to put a lot of sunscreen on them. Because their skin is very sensitive to the sun. I thought, that poor pig <laughs> laying out there, sunscreen slathered all over it. All that pig wants to do is go back to the pig pen and cool off again. That's how some people are. They're comfortable that way. You want to know the real reason people don't come to Christ? Sometimes people will say, well, I'd be a Christian, but uh, I believe in evolution. Or I'd become a Christian, but there's too many hypocrites in the church. Well, I'd become a Christian, but I have these questions to ask God. Oh, I'd be, no, none of those are the truth. You want to know the real reason people don't want to become Christians? You want to know the real reason it's so hard to get someone to come to church with you? You want to know the real reason someone will actually stop you mid-sentence and ask you not to say the name Jesus? Here's the answer according to Christ himself. Also in John, John chapter 3, verse 9, Jesus says, their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came to the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. They hate the light because they want to sin in the darkness. They stay away from the light for fear their sins will be exposed and they will be punished. See, deep down inside, they know there's a judgment. Deep down inside, they know they have to answer for their sins. So they don't want to hear about it. They don't want you to tell them about it. And they're comfortable where they are in the dark. History tells the story of a castle-like prison in Paris known as the Bastille. They decided to destroy it because it had outlived its usefulness. And there was a prisoner who had been kept there for many years. It was in a dark, dingy dungeon. And after years of being incarcerated, 
he was brought out. And instead of welcoming his new freedom, he begged to be taken back in. It had been so long since this man had seen the sun. He was blind by its radiance. That's how a lot of people are. They're comfortable in the dark and they want to stay there. And that pattern continues on until these people become so hardened in their sin they prefer their dark ways of eternal death to the light of the gospel. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was Oswald Chambers who said, sin enough and you will soon be unconscious of sin. And he even lost his voice while he was doing it. <clears throat> Sorry. As you'll know, I'm having some voice problems, so <clears throat> I'm working on it. Pray for me. <laughs> Let me go back to Oswald Chambers again. I don't want you to miss that. He said, sin enough, and you will soon be unconscious of sin. End quote. So, do you want to be made well? Jesus asked this man. He could ask the same of us. Do you really want your marriage healed? Do you really want to be free from that addiction? Do you really want to change the course of your life? Well, there's God's part and there's your part. The man says in verse seven, I can't, sir. I have no one to put me in the pool. He's saying, I want to be healed, but someone has to get me to the water when the angel stirs it. And many are like this today. They, they, I want to change, but I don't know how. Hey, man, this is not about getting to the pool. This is about me touching your life right now. Now I want you to notice that Jesus' response to this person is important. He shows them how he can change. He asks for three things. Number one, Jesus asks the impossible. Number two, he removes all possibility of a relapse. And number three, he expects continued success. Let's go over those one by one. Number one, he asks the impossible. He asks this man to do what he has not been able to do for 38 years. Verse 8, Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. But you see, here's the thing. If God asks you to do it, you can do it, because with God, nothing is impossible. I know it seems like it is, but it isn't. Sort of like when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Hey, man, it's me. Come on. And Peter did walk on the water for a time. He didn't stay in the water very long. But he did get out there and do the impossible because Jesus told him to. Now, when Jesus said, pick up your bed and mock, walk, the guy might have thought Christ was mocking him. Well, you, know, you know I can't do that. If I even tried, it would collapse in a heap. No, you can do it. Do what I tell you to do. He asks the impossible. Number two, Jesus removes all possibility of a relapse. Notice he says, pick up your bed and walk. He doesn't say walk, but leave your little mat there in case you change your mind and want to go back. No, take that thing. You're done here. You're not hanging around here anymore. Your life is going to change. Pick up your bed and walk. And the same way when we come to Christ, we make a break with our past, and it's a good thing to burn our bridges. The story is told of when Elijah called his successor Elisha. Elisha was out plowing in the field. Elijah came and threw his mantle on him, sort of his outer garment, which symbolically said, you're taking over when I'm gone. And, and Elijah is out there with his plow, and he says, oh, wait, 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 let me go and kiss my mother and father goodbye. Elijah says, hey, what have I done to you? In other words, hey, if you don't want to come, don't come. If you need to go home to mommy, go home. By the way, you are a grown man. Uh, you gonna go for this or not? I'm not pressuring you. I'm not forcing you. So then Elisha takes his plow, chops it up, takes his cattle, chops them up, and they have barbecue. That's called burning your bridges. Because he couldn't go back to the plow or the cattle because they're in his stomach now, you see? He's made a break with the past. And we have to do the same. A lot of people make a commitment to follow Christ, but they never make that break with the past. They drag their past with them. They drag those old sins with them. They won't break off relationships with people that take them down spiritually. If you want to follow him, you can make no provision for a relapse. Remember years ago, we had our first crusade at the Pacific Amphitheater. And by the way, this year, as you know, is the 25th anniversary of Harvest Crusades. Can you believe that? 25 years. <clears throat> and we're gonna have a really amazing crusade this year at the Angel Stadium. 
going to be like a big party <laughs> as well as an evangelistic outreach as we celebrate all that the Lord has done. But I don't know why this story has stayed with me all these years, but it may have been year one or possibly year two. A guy came forward at the invitation who was a drug dealer and he gave his pager to the counselor. Now let me explain to you what a pager is. <laughs> Some of you are saying, what is that? It's sort of the size of a cell phone, but less sophisticated. See, back in the old days, before we had cell phones, uh, we had pagers. And so if someone wanted to get hold of you, they paid you, the little number came up on your pager, and you went to something called a pay phone. <laughs> you put money in it, and then you push buttons, or if you're really old, you turn the little dial, right? right? And then you call the person. That's how it works. So this guy comes forward. He turns in his pager. Why? Because it was his, he used the pager to make drug deals. When people wanted to buy drugs, they paged him. He says, I don't need this anymore. Gave the pager to the counselor. I love that. And then the counselor called him the next day. Hey, how are you doing spiritually? He goes, well, I'm out mowing the grass. The counselor said, oh, doing some yard work. No, I'm mowing the grass. I'm mowing down my marijuana plants because I have a lot of them. I love that. That's a guy making a break with the past. <laughs> You'll hear people say, well, I tried Christianity, but it didn't work for me. Nonsense. I don't believe you. Because Christianity is not a product that works for some and doesn't work for others. You didn't do your part. You see, Jesus expects continued success from this man. He says, walk. Don't expect to be carried. You've got to do your part. If Christianity didn't work, that's on you, not on God. I mean like a person saying, yeah, well, I wanted to get in shape, so I joined the health club first of the year. Didn't do anything for me. Did you ever go there? Yeah, I went there first time and ate some of their food. <laughs> Did you work out? No, but I ate. The food's lousy, by the way. A lot of tofu and something like it. So now every other day you say to your wife, I'm going to go to the health club, but you go to the donut short shop next door. Uh, and now you're, you're getting in shape, just not the shape you wanted to be in. <laughs> it's not a good shape. It's a shape of a pear, actually. <laughs> Your friends are calling you the Lord's pear. And so <laughs> that's because you didn't do your part. If you want to get in shape, you got to get in there and work at it. And in the same way, we want to be a Christian. We don't work for our salvation. That's a gift of God. But if you're a Christian, you live it out. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. That verse does not say, work for your salvation. It says, work it out. In the words of St. Paul and St. John, we can work it out. Never mind. Okay, so <laughs> that's a Beatles song. Forget it. St. John, St. Forget it. Let's go back to pagers for a moment. No, um, that song was even before pagers, actually. But the work it out means carry it to the goal and fully complete. Get all the potential out of it. And so for people that say, I tried Christianity and it didn't work for me, I wonder if they even applied themselves. Number one, after you were supposedly converted, did you ever read and study the Bible? And did you commit Scripture to memory? Psalm 119 says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Paul says to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My granddaughters know more scripture than some adult Christians I've met who've been believers for over 25 years. My granddaughters can recite, recite entire passages just because they've been taught to do that. That's fantastic. Did you memorize scripture? Did you get actively involved in a church? Not hopping around from church to church or going sporadically when you thought of it, but were you an active part of a church? The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. Hey, here's one. Did you get baptized? The Bible says, repent and be baptized. Now, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but if you're saved, why wouldn't you be baptized? You're commanded to be baptized. You didn't do that either. 
Let me ask you another question. Did you turn from all known sin after your supposed conversion? We're told that Psalm 66, 18, if I hold on to sin, the Lord will not hear my prayers. Hey, did you develop a prayer life? The Bible says pray without ceasing, for this is God's will. So you didn't pray, you didn't go to church, you didn't memorize scripture, you held on to sin, and you wonder why it didn't work out. Come on. Pick up your bed and walk. Get going. You see, you've got your part and God has his part. He'll forgive you, but then you have to apply yourself. And did you keep his commandments? First John 2, 3 says, We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. And the man who says, I know him, and does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If it didn't work, it's your own fault because we're not dealing with an it. We're dealing with a him. So here he is. Do you want to be changed? Do you want your life to change? Are you where you need to be spiritually? Another question God asked is clear back in the Garden of Eden. It was to Adam after he sinned. The Lord God spoke to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? Why did God ask that? Because God was oblivious to the whereabouts of Adam? Hardly. It's like when I play hide and seek with my grandchildren. They're not very good at it. They haven't learned the ways of deception yet. Like they'll hide behind the curtain and I see their feet and I hear them giggling. And here's the thing, I'll say no, that's not a good hiding place. Hide here. So they'll hide there and then we'll play it again and they hide in the same place. I'll say you can't hide in the same place again. Now Christopher, our grandson, he's just a little guy he actually thinks he's hiding when he puts his hands over his eyes. <laughs> he put his hands in his eyes and say, where's Christopher? Where's Christopher? We're playing along. That's how it is when we try to hide from God. God knew where Adam was. God did not want information. He wanted confession. He wanted Adam to say, I'm here because I sinned, because I didn't do what you told me to do. Where are you? And God can ask the same of us right now. Where are you? Well, I'm sitting in church. Second service, hoping Greg ends soon. <laughs> the sad thing, those are my thoughts. <laughs> That's not what I mean. Where are you? Where are you at spiritually? Are you where you need to be as a Christian right now? Well, if you were to ask me that question, my answer would be yes and no. On one hand, I would say, well, I'm where I need to be in Christ. I've trusted in Him. I know He's my Savior and Lord. But am I where I should be or where I could be? Could I be stronger? Could I know more? Could I be more Christ-like? Of course. So in the same way I could say, I am where I want to be, but I'm not quite where I want to be yet. Even the Apostle Paul, after years of walking with the Lord, said, hey man, it's not as though I've already attained. I haven't reached some spiritual plateau. I have a long ways to go. So I'm letting go of the things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are before. And I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Every believer should recognize there's a long ways to go. Where are you? That's what God asked Adam. Let's say you called me on the phone and said, I want to come to church at Harvest Riverside today. You know what my question to you would be then? Where are you? Now why do I ask that? Because I'm nosy? No. Because I can't tell you how to get here until I know where you are. If you're in San Bernardino, I'm going to give you different directions and I'm going to give you if you're coming from Orange County. So you say, well, I'm in Irvine. Okay, you want to come to Riverside? Get on the 55, go up to the 91, take the 91 straight into Riverside, get off on Adams, and then sit at the light for one hour right? One hour. <laughs> Still sitting. Anyway, then turn left. Take Adams. It intersects into Arlington. It'll spit you out in our parking lot. The reason I ask you where you are is so I can tell you where you want to be. And God says, where are you? And here's what we need to say. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not where I should be, Lord. I, I need to change. And I know there are some things that are not right. Well, then here's what you need to do. Or you might say, well, I don't even know you yet. Well, you need to believe in Jesus. And that brings us to 
our communion service. I want to read Paul's words now about why we do this together. And that's the second passage I told you to turn to. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For this is what the Lord Jesus said. And I pass it on to you just as I received it. One night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat of this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Now listen. If anyone eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup unworthily or in an unworthy manner, not honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. Now look at verse 30. This is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we examine ourselves, we will not be examined by God and judged in this way. Now this brings us back to the words of Jesus to the man he healed. Verse 14, you're well now, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. This verse and the one before us in 1 Corinthians bring a serious point home. Although scripture is clear that illness is not always an immediate result of personal sin, it does teach that some sicknesses are a direct result of disobedience. There is cause and effect. There are things that you can do and then reap the consequences of. Listen to what David said after he committed adultery. <clears throat> Before he confessed his sin, he was hiding his sin. Here's what it did to him internally. Psalm 38, he says to God, because of your anger, my whole body is sick. My health is broken. Because of my sin, my guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. I am bent over and racked with pain, and my days are filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me, and my health is broken. I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. Isn't that interesting? David is saying, I'm physically feeling this right now. Listen, when you don't confess your sin, it tears you up inside. But because David was a man after God's own heart, he ultimately confessed his sin. <clears throat> what we have just read sounds depressing, but in reality, it shows that David's conscience was working. Is yours? I think if you're right with God, when you come to church to worship, you're aware of God's presence. But I think if you're not right with God and you come to church, it's not the happiest place for you. You're not in your sweet spot like the pig in the sty. You're thinking, I'm a little uncomfortable here. Is that a bad thing? You see, my job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And if you're comfortable in church and living in sin, I'm not doing my job right. Because if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a preacher and a teacher, as you hear God's word, it will make you want to change. It would be like somebody coming into the emergency room at the hospital and needing the doctor's attention, and the doctor looked at them and paused and took a sip of water. <laughs> <clears throat> then the doctor said, you have an open wound and we need to take care of that. We have to dress it. <clears throat> I sound worse after I drink the water. Uh, and we need to get you fixed up. So the doctor sees the problem and tells you the solution. Well, the same is true of our life spiritually. God identifies the problem, and now he wants to get to the heart of it. And if you're not a Christian, here's what your problem is. You need Jesus Christ. You need his forgiveness. Because after Jesus was here in the upper room with his disciples, he went to the cross, and he died for the sin of the world. He died for your sin, and he died for mine. And he'll come and forgive you of all of your sin right now if you'll turn from it. But then there are some of you that maybe need to come back to the Lord. You're not where you ought to be spiritually. You're not in that place that you ought to be as a follower of Christ. I'm just going to fall apart right before you. 
<clears throat> Doesn't it make you all want to clear your throat for me? One more sip of water. I'm going to be all right, trust me. So maybe you're not where you should be, but God can forgive you. And if you're trying to live a double life or live in two worlds, you don't want to come to this communion table and receive these elements without being right with God. That's why the scripture says, let a man examine himself. So if you need to make a commitment or recommitment to Christ, why don't you do that right now? As we all bow our heads in prayer, everybody praying, please. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for coming and dying on that cross for our sin and rising again from the dead. And now you're ready to forgive any person who will put their faith in you. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying. How many of you would say today, Greg, I want Jesus Christ. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know with confidence that I will go to heaven when I die. Pray for me. If you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, if you want your guilt taken away, if you want to know God in a personal way, would you lift your hand up right now and let me pray for you wherever you are. You want Christ to come into your life. You want him to forgive you of your sin. Lift your hand up and I'll pray for you. God bless you. Lift it up higher where I can see it if you would. God bless you. God bless you. All around the room. You guys watching by satellite, watching the screen, you raise your hand up too. I can't see you. It doesn't matter. The Lord sees you. You need Christ in your life. Raise your hand up right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? You want his forgiveness. You want to know him. Raise your hand up. Let me pray for you. God bless you. While our heads are still bowed, maybe there would be some here saying, hey, I've been trying to live in two worlds. I've been living that compromised life. I don't want to come to this communion table in that state. I'm ready to repent of that sin. I want to change and be forgiven. If you need to make that recommitment to Jesus, would you raise your hand up right now and let me pray for you. God bless you. Lift it up higher where I can see it, please. God bless. God bless all of you. Wherever you are, you watching the screens, raise your hand up. Now I'm going to ask every one of you that have raised your hand, if you would please, stand to your feet. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Just stand up. If you raise your hand, even if you did not, but you want to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, stand up. And we're going to pray together. Stand up. God bless you guys that are standing. By the way, others are standing, so you won't be alone. Anybody else? Stand. Let me pray with you. One final moment. You want to make this commitment or recommitment to Jesus. Stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? One last moment. If you're going to stand, stand now. God bless you in you. All right, you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray, you pray this out loud, right where you stand. Pray this if you would, please. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're a Savior, and you died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I repent of my sin. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, God.